Hello, everyone. Welcome to the LockingYourSuccess.com Trading Performance Podcast, where it's all about real traders, real problems, and real coaching. Today is episode number 45, and I have a special treat for you today. I'm interviewing Jared Tendler. He is a leading expert in the mental game of performance, and he's just written a new book called The Mental Game of Trading. This is a fantastic interview, and I hope you enjoy it. Today I'm speaking with Jared Tendler, and Jared is a leading expert on how your mental game impacts your performance. He works with some of the top poker players in the world, as well as athletes, PGA Tour players, and of course, financial traders. Jared is also an author. His books include The Mental Game of Poker, The Mental Game of Poker 2, and his newest book, The Mental Game of Trading. And if that wasn't enough, he also has a podcast called The Mental Game. So Jared, hello. Welcome. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. Can you tell us a little, a little bit about yourself and why you wrote the book? Yeah. So I was originally a golfer, an aspiring professional uh, myself. Kind of got derailed as I was beginning to kind of level up and uh, trying to qualify for the U.S. Open, U.S. Amateur, some kind of big national events. Um, I was a three-time All-American in college, won nine times. So, you know, it wasn't kind of out of the realm for me to become a professional, but, you know, kind of my mental game derailed me at that point. And you know, I kind of had to make a choice between trying to be a professional, which was not really my style. Um, if I didn't really believe that I could do it, uh, given kind of those hangups, or I decided to kind of, in my mind, kind of kind of solve for what per, uh, sports psychology, golf psychology uh, was kind of limiting at that point in my career. This was, you know, 25 years ago sure. um, and, and kind of went off and got a, uh, a second um, major in, in psychology, got a master's degree in counseling psychology, spent two years, 3,200 hours. Uh, of practice to get licensed as a therapist, uh, never with the intent to practice. I wanted to kind of take the skills of a therapist and combine it with sports psychology and cr- kind of created this kind of hybrid between the two um, and then uh, began working with golfers in Arizona, building up kind of a roster. Um, actually, one of my uh, clients right now is, uh, you know, tied for seventh on the Corn Ferry Tour. You know, I started working with, when he, with him when he was 10 years old, uh, which is cool. So, but, you know, working with golfers and then all of a sudden uh, poker kind of popped up on the horizon and there was literally nobody doing performance psychology and in, in, in poker in 2008. And, you know, saw this huge kind of marketplace to dive into, um, kind of steadily built up a, a client roster there and wrote the two books you mentioned. And then around 2013, uh, traders started picking up the poker book and sort of said, well, well you changed the word, you know, poker to trading. And if you got, you got yourself a new book and it's like, okay, I, and I didn't actually, you know, do that with this book. I'll get to that in a right, second. That was obvious. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I did pick up the book and I was reading it. It's an excellent book. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and, and then the other kind of thing that happened was that in 2016, um, I got approached by Team Liquid, which is the largest uh, e-sport organization in the world. So for four years, I was their, uh, their head of sports psychology working with the, the e-sport athletes. So, you know, again, I'm a, I'm a golfer kind of by trade, trained a, a, a psychologist, so to speak, although I'm not a PhD, so trained a therapist, and then kind of have learned the markets of poker uh, trading and esports, and kind of adapting my material to those markets. And so, you know, when I looked at you know kind of what to do next, the the trading book was kind of a natural extension given my work with traders for that time, uh, but it also kind of gave me a, a chance to kind of consolidate my knowledge for from the last ten years, and and that's kind of what's reflected in this book now. Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at human performance, it doesn't matter what field you're looking at. We're all human beings, and regardless of what we're trying to perform really well, then we all have the same problems, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I think the key is, you know, you become influential most when you're able to kind of understand the way that, you know, in this case, traders think, the the marketplace that they're they're competing in. You know, I, I think the general sports psychology, I'm not a big fan of because it may provide like really good kind of high level ideas. But it right. leaves a lot to the athlete, the trader, the consumer to be able to kind of interpret and, and um, you know, uh, apply to them. Now, now, a lot of people, when they come into trading, because there's such a low threshold, right? It's not like you're entering the NBA where you train for so many years to do that. You can basically have anyone who has a thousand bucks and uh, an internet connection can be a trader. It's a very low threshold of entry. But how would you compare the type of emotions and challenges that a trader might have compared to somebody who spent years learning a sport? So my, I'd say my specialty is working with just professionals in general that already have, you know, a basis of experience. And, and so within the trading world, that means they have a system or a strategy that they've been testing for a while. 
and they have proven that they're either, you know, profitable enough, you know, kind of limited by their own mental game, or, you know, they, they recognize that their inability to consistently execute that strategy is being severely impaired by their mental and emotional functioning. And so th those people are the ones that I work with. I really don't work with beginners because, you know, in the early stages, it's really hard to know whether your emotional reactions, whether the problems you're experiencing are due to your inexperience, um, your lack of competency and your lack of skill. And the same can be true with a poker player. Right? I mean, you know, it doesn't take, there's no barrier to entry in that regard either, especially right. with online poker. Um, so it's hard to know if it's that it's hard to know if, you know, you're kind of bring, I mean, you're bringing in, you know, kind of the, the, the patterning from previous performance environments or previous personal uh, experiences at, kind of into trading. Um, right. or whether it's, so it's just kind of too messy for me at that point to kind of work with that group. I kind of need somebody more experienced to be able to kind of have already done that, that kind of differentiation between. Well, know, that makes the, sense because you're not a trader per se by yeah. trade. You're more of a, of a psychologist. So, so ultimately, would you say a beginner, a beginning point for a trader is going to be essentially just assembling all the skills that he needs to do in order to become successful? Yes, I would. I mean, I think if, if I were to say what my, my perception of what's ideal, the ideal would be if you're a beginning trader, find a system or a strategy that you can begin to learn on and just gain some competency with it. It may not end up being the right one for you long term. It, that doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. It's giving you a starting point. You know, you can learn some of the basic fundamentals like just, you know, risk management as a, as a key well, one. Well, it's all about gaining competency at first. The, so I think the, other, the, other, the other thing you can do, though is to sort of self-evaluate how you have, you know, kind of underperformed or struggled in other performance environments or, you know, what things you might think may be kind of triggered on a mental and emotional standpoint within trading. Now, you're not going to do a ton of work on that. You know, I think you're, you're early on, you want to put, you know, 80 to 90% of your focus on developing the competency as a trader or the, within that system. And then you can kind of be mildly working on the personal stuff. Uh, but ultimately, you know, it, it's the competency, I think, that you want to le be leading with. But you can do both. You just have to, I, I think, kind of tread lightly, li lightly there. But when you're, they're in that stage, what happens if they become, you know, so someone decides they want to be a great trader, right? And they come in and, I don't know, they buy some set of rules or something or an indicator or whatever. And then they expect perfect results all the time, right? I, I want to win consistently, what do you think about that path that somebody might take? Yeah. So then we're talking about, I think, a set of sort of psychological principles that I would consider to be the fundamentals. And I'm, I'm certain that you talk about them, you know, a, a book like trading in the zone, you know, comes in handy. Um, other books by like, uh, you know, uh, Steenbarger come in handy because there you're sort of learning the, the, the kind of the, the nature of the environment. Right. So, you know, if you have previous experience, let's say in sports, where, you know, yeah, the better team is going to win most often, right? The better player is going to win more often. And so you kind of have these expectations that are kind of more performance related and not really kind of firmly understanding the environment with which you're competing in, you know, kind of no different than let's say, okay, let's say you were going to open up a business and it was going to be a retail business, you know, yes. Okay. You got to do your market analysis and you have to understand the fundamentals of the business, but you have to understand your customer base and understand, you know, how your business is going to interact with the market. And that becomes kind of what, what a trader needs to learn, how your system is going to interact with the market and what reliable, you know, kind of feedback you're going to get and ultimately what expectations you're going to gain. Um, so early on, yeah, you can kind of reshape those principles. To me, that, that's not really my purview. I think, you know, I'm, I, I think all that, that space has been kind of covered quite well um, okay. in terms of the, the, the way you need to be thinking as a trader. That's not, so where, where my work comes in is more in the, okay, there's a long track record where you've been, have been learning this system, you've been learning these psychological principles, and yet you're still continuing to expect, right? And then there becomes more of this sort of unconscious reasoning for why it is that you're blocked by that. And that becomes the place where, where my work starts to kind of be helpful in unlocking that. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I, we have a lot of traders in that realm where they started trading, they get into trading. And I think it's a whole, it all starts with the beginning process as they start trading. They come into trading expecting to, like I said, find an indicator or whatever. They're going to win all the time. Then they find they don't win all the time. So they go to the next thing and then they go to the next thing and then they go to the next thing and they get caught in this loop and it 
you look at them 10 years later, they're still going to the next thing and to the next thing, right? They've never really gotten to the next thing. Is that something that you would be specialized in dealing with? Yeah, because at that point, we're talking about a significantly repetitive pattern that has nothing to do with you know, your ability to develop competency. It's, it has to do with your ability to understand what it is that you're even doing. Um, right. you know, I think the, you know, there's a story in the book um, by a Japanese client of mine who, uh, at the time he was living in the U.S., got into cryptocurrency trading in 2017 and obviously bull market, you know, making a ton of money, sure. more money than he was in his part-time job, decided to quit and become a full-time trader, but had no idea really what he was getting into. Um, his wife was pregnant with their first son. Uh, it was a very chaotic environment because crypto markets open 24 seven. His just stress out of his mind as he's effectively like losing money, even though the, you know, prices to continue to go up as he's buying and selling, et cetera. And what we discovered was that, deep down, he had this wish that he could just get lucky. Um, he didn't actually want to become a skilled trader. He would <laughs> rather be lucky than, than good. And, and kind of becoming aware of that was actually the catalyst for him actually beginning to, to make some progress. Um, and, and, you know, I called him out on it very clearly because I think a lot of traders come in and, you know, listen, the media does a very good job of, and, and it's the same, the same in poker, right? You see these big you know, very successful traders out there. You see these huge paydays and, you know, on the online poker world and you think, well, that's what I want. It becomes no different than trying to win the lottery. Um, and if that's what you're after, then you're better off buying a lottery ticket. Um, but, you know, if you actually want to become skilled and competent, then you cannot rely on luck, right? There's not a single trader in the world that is successful long-term that relies on luck. Yes, they do get good luck at times. And of course, there are going to be some that are going to have you know, outside returns as a result of it. However, you know, an edge in the market is no different than an edge in golf, no different than an edge, you know, as an esport athlete or, you know, a pool player, right? That edge is what yields you profit over time. And, and developing that takes long sustained, you know, skill development. That's, that's no different than anything else. And that brings up an important um, thing. So one of the things that you say in the book that is that, or you call focusing or being overly focused on your profit and loss, a trading error. And that's a, uh, an example of that, right? Because the, the interesting thing about trading is you can get lucky and you can have a long period of success and really not know what you're doing. 100%. So why is, so can you go a little bit deeper into why focusing on your profit and loss for each individual outcome might be a trading error? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I like how softly you put that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we won't say it's a massive issue. Prob <laughs> uh, yeah. But so, you want to say that, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You want to scream. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, I think, I think that in sports in general, and certainly in trading, this, this concept of process oriented thinking has really kind of taken hold over the years. And in some respects, it's almost kind of taken over too much. So I want to put this into context. It is very, very important that you never lose sight of your goals and what you're trying to accomplish results wise, like money is the scoreboard, right? We're, you know, there's no NBA basketball player who's out there just to have fun. They right. want to win games. They want to win championships that, that those results matter. The question becomes, how do you create those results? And in the short term, it's not like basketball. The amount of false feedback that you get in the near term is really difficult to sustain for a lot of people, you know, much like it is for poker players, right? You go through these stretches where you are doing quote unquote, everything right. And, and getting just completely destroyed, or you're making a lot of mistakes and getting rewarded for it. So how do you distinguish between those two points? I, I think we have to look at the nature and the desire for feedback, right? As human beings, we require feedback in order to learn, in order to know how to make adjustments and adapt our strategy and continue to level up. You know, I, I often kind of relate this as a, you know, imagine a PGA Tour player on the driving range practicing, and they never get to see where the ball goes. I mean, right. the quality of their practice would be so significantly compromised that they wouldn't that their game would be would be significantly stifled. So, so the reality is we need feedback. The question is how accurate is that feedback? And that's the problem with focusing too much on results in the short term. So, you know, as you've seen in the book, there's a, a, a tool that I developed called the A to C game analysis, where I have traders write out very detailed descriptions of what their A game looks like from a mental standpoint, from a tactical standpoint. Right? Tactically, we're looking at all right, what are you thinking about when you're making these high quality trades? You know, what, what indicators are you looking at? What, what, what are you sensing, you know, in the market that you might not be able to sense in your B game or C game? And you do the exact same thing for, 
you know, your B game and your, and your C game mentally and tactically, like what in mm-hmm. C game tactically, we might look at the kind of mistakes you're making. Uh, what are the biases that you're kind of bringing into the market? Uh, what are the changes in your perception of what's going on or how your, your strategy interacts with the type of market that you're experiencing? Uh, and if you do that, then it gives you a way to kind of evaluate yourself either trade by trade or day by day that, that I'm I'm not going to say is perfect, right? Because there's bias in any type of feedback, but what it does do is help to give you a little bit of an offset so that you're not as focused on results in the near term. So at the end of a a trade or at the end of a day, you can look at your A to C game analysis and say, ah, okay, for the most part, I was in the sort of A and B game range. And if you've proven over time that that, level of competency is, is profitable and you got destroyed today, then you know that it was mostly, you know, due to the market. We're not going to say that firmly because maybe the market has changed and you do need to adapt, but at least you don't know enough yet how to adapt it. So you can kind of just chill out and just go back at it tomorrow. And on the flip side, you know, if you know that you were, you know, jumping into trades, you shouldn't be uh, making some moves that, that were otherwise kind of out of your, out of the realm of your strategy and, and, and more of that kind of C game, uh, state and you made a ton of money, then it's likely you got lucky. So it just gives you a way of kind of buffering and kind of modulating your emotions day to day. I love the term you use, uh, false feedback. So we use, yeah, false yeah. feedback is, is very common in trading because like you said, you can run uh, extended periods of time, especially we do the type of trading we do a lot of times is it's market neutral options trading. So we have trades that last for a period of like 60 days. It's almost like a game of chess. We're moving options around trying to keep the uh, profit in a certain level. It's very strategic, but you can do everything right and lose. And you can, and you can do everything wrong and you can win. And sometimes you can win for a period of years uh, in ours, because we're, we're we're basically playing one trade a month, so you can you can win for a period of years and have that be completely luck driven rather right. than process driven, and that is definitely uh, some potential false feedback there. And so the question becomes how how do you know? When you were talking about your A game, your B game, and C game, can you give some like maybe a specific example of what an A game might look like versus maybe a C game? So I can, from a mental standpoint, from a tactical standpoint, I think that's where, you know, having, you know, good resources like yourself around you to be able to provide that, you know, whether it's other colleagues or other traders, um, from a mental standpoint, you know, we're going to look at, okay, what is the quality of your focus, uh, your decision-making process? Uh, you know, how connected are you to your goals? What's your emotional state like? So obviously when you're in your A game, you know, you're in the zone or close to it. So, you know, there's going to be a sense of either, you know, I, I think, Energy state is variable, right? So some people feel a very sort of serene calmness when they're in that in the zone. Even if the market's going crazy, they feel sort of tranquil, right? Very calm. Right. Um, others are at their best when there actually is a lot of intensity, um, or you know, some are kind of in between. So you kind of have to figure out what that ideal level of energy is like for you. But obviously, it's going to be present there. Um, your B game becomes kind of this intersection where your flaws and that ideal state kind of start to kind of uh, conflict. So what'll happen is you'll have, let's say thoughts to jump into a trade um, or thoughts to pre- maybe lock up some profit prematurely, but you're still able to actually avoid making those mistakes. Um, and so, you know, there might be increased tension. There might be some frustration. Um, you know, uh, maybe at times you're, you can sort of tend towards boredom. So you might open up, you know, Twitter, even though you're not necessarily looking for uh, trade ideas like you would normally, it's more of sort of an autopiloted mode. But again, it's not so severe that you're getting consumed by that distraction. And then C game would be qualified by kind of you at your worst, right? This is where you're going to be far more emotionally compromised, whether that's, uh, you know, some tilt or some anger, uh, whether that's a lot, lack of confidence and some self doubts, uh, overthinking, uh, questioning your decisions. Um, it also can be overconfidence where now all of a sudden you're, you know, getting a bit too euphoric and, and assuming that the next trade is going to hit and making assumptions about what's to come. So, you know, I think basically a game is you at your best. C game is you at your worst, and then B game is sort of the battle for which one's going to win. Great. Now, it, when you were talking about B game, and I want to know why this is in the B game, you talked about taking profits early, or taking a small profit maybe than what your profit target may have been. Why is that? Why would that be considered in the B game? Wouldn't it be good just to close the trade and lock in the win? I mean, if that's part of your strategy, sure. But I mean, a lot of times that's <laughs> that's done out of fear, right? It's done out of uh, some necessity, right? Not, not based off of your system. So, you know, if you have, uh, uh, you know, 
depending on how you're getting in and out of trades, if you're, you know, kind of scaling in and out of them, then, then yeah, you can. But if you're, if you're taking too much off the table too quickly, you're limiting your upside massively in some cases. Yeah. And one of the things that I talk to people about is when they limit their upside, they have to remember that there's a downside. Absolutely. You yeah. don't win every trade just because you're taking your profits early and you have to be making enough profits to cover your downside. Otherwise, the long term numbers don't work out. The math yeah. doesn't work. So to speak. There was, you know, there's another uh, trader that I mentioned in, in, um, uh, in the book. It's under the kind of the revenge tilt section. But this this technique can be used for for any particular issue. And so he was actually a long time options trader um, as well, uh, you know, working in Wall, on Wall Street. Um, and so he was used to managing a book of let's say 30 positions with kind of rolling, you know, 60 uh, or 30 to 60 day, um, you know, options periods. But then when he went to futures trading and we started doing kind of intraday, uh, this intraday strategy, it was very, very difficult for him because now all of a sudden every individual trade felt very massive and, you know, his expectations for how much he should be hitting, you know, was a lot greater because of his options experience um, and, and how, you know, typically he was profitable month over month. Right. And, and so, for him, like losing individual trades felt like a losing month, which on the surface sounds weird, but you know, he had been kind of wired for 10 years, kind of thinking in those terms. So making that transition was very difficult for him. But one of the ways that he was, that, you know, he was, and we were able to get out of it was um, he uh, basically kind of created this sheet with a, with a uh, uh, 25 boxes on it. And every single time that he executed his trade, ideally, right, all five criteria were, you know, uh, kind of checked off to get in. He set his stop loss. He set his profit target. If he kind of managed the trade exactly at that, he got a check mark. And at the end of those 25, that's when he looked at his results. So it became a way of kind of working out of this, not only results oriented mindset, but also this tendency to want to take profit prematurely, because that was something that he was doing as well. Um, and, and it just focused on execution. And, you know, you think about that kind of training, I liken it to a golfer's golf swing, you know, a basketball player's jump shot, right? There's a technique right. to how your mind is making decisions. And sometimes you do just need to force yourself and train it because it's no different than the, the golfer, you know, spending hours, the basketball player spending hours practicing that technique. I think sometimes the, the intersection between psychology and the mind gets fuzzy within trading because we think about the decision-making process as psychology. And to me, it's not, it's technique. Yes, there are psychological factors that can influence it and pull it apart, but that's true in golf and in, in, in basketball. So we have to look right. at the decision-making process as an entity in, into itself. And yes, of course, we can look at the effects that emotion uh, you know, and fatigue and otherwise can have on it, but sometimes you just need to freaking train it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You have to do the work, right? Yeah. Hey, let's, um, let's just turn to confidence, um, fear, greed, stuff like that. So, so uh, one of the interesting things that I kind of got out of the book, and I don't know if you specifically wrote this, is that a lot of traders who present or have a presenting problem of risk, aver risk aversion and fear, that's not the real problem. As you said in the book, the problem isn't the problem. Some of them actually are dealing with greed and overconfidence. Yeah, cool. So, so I, I think in general, when I work with clients, um, very, very few of them are really accurate about the actual problems they're experiencing. So yes, there are instances uh, of fear where it's actually anger. Um, but I'd say kind of the bigger topic is around greed. So in my, you know, kind of research for the book, and I, I, I interviewed a lot of, of, of traders, I, I worked with, you know, traders that weren't kind of part of my, 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 you know, client base, just to make sure that I was kind of getting a, a wider universe of styles and, and, and interests and perspectives. And, and I, I didn't get a single trader that had a problem with greed that actually had a problem with greed. And that's because what are we really even talking about? I mean, your job is to make money. So how is that greedy? Right. And so right. the more we start to look at it, to me, greed is a performance problem that is most often associated with the other issues of like fear and anger and overconfidence and, and, and a lack of confidence, because, you know, if we start to look at it, you know, in relation to sports, no one would ever say that Tiger Woods or Serena Williams or, you know, any elite athlete was greedy for trying to win championships, right? That's not greed. That's ambition. Right. You know, so the Gordon Gecko quote of, you know, greed is good is often misquoted, right? We forget that it's, he says greed for lack of a better word. To me, the better word is ambition. 
And if we look at it as ambition, then all, all greed is, is just excessive ambition where you are violating your trading strategy or system, you know, in some way, you know, trying to make more of it in a way that's not going to pay off reliably long-term. So that becomes Tiger Woods trying to hit shots that he actually can't hit. Right. Which, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe now a different story, but back in his heyday, we're, we're more limited than most traders, but, or most, most golfers. But the point is, or let's say you take a, you know, a baseball player, you know, uh, trying to score on, on a sack fly. It's like, all right, well, this, this ball was hit to short right field. Like you're, you're sitting, you're a sitting duck unless that baseball player recognizes something in that outfielder that says my odds of success here are greater. So it really becomes very much individualized. Like the, each trader has to define where that line is between, you know, ambition and excessive ambition. And that's a tough one on the outside to determine, right? So Mm -hmm. what we end up looking at is, okay, what's causing those emotions? What's causing that excessive ambition? And when we, when we look at it, I didn't find anything that was unique to greed because what would, again, what are we really talking about? They all had to do with the problems associated with fear and anger and, and confidence issues. So, you know, in the, in the greed chapter, I described four, four traders who, kind of came to me saying they had problems with greed among others, but greed was not the problem, right? When we looked at it, right. one of the traders had what I would call a weak process. This was a 15 year trading veteran who, you know, when he had, had these like massive opportunities uh, in the market, he wasn't trusting his intuition. He was going out, you know, looking for advice from other traders um, and, and was struggling. And it turned out that, you know, there was some kind of weakness in his system in his process or his, his kind of comprehension of it. And kind of simplifying that made made what he thought was greed, you know, kind of go away. Another guy was struggling with perfectionism. Um, another one was sure. struggling with uh, with illusions of control. Uh, another one was struggling with a, with a variety of problems. But they all again had that commonality of of thinking they had greed when it turned out to be something else. Yeah, and I think all the emotions you just mentioned are very common in trading. One of the quotes I saw in the book, and I'm going to paraphrase, it was uh, most newer traders come into this business more confident than maybe a 20 year veteran or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's why confidence is not um, like a reliable measure of competence. You know, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you want to be competent more than you want to feel confident. There's a, there's a, 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 a flaw that I, I talk about in the book called the Dunning Kruger effect. And, and this talks about, um, uh, this dynamic where people who are un- inexperienced, they are oftentimes overconfident because they have no idea how inexperienced they actually are or how bad they actually are. And on the flip side, you have people who are extremely competent, but they falsely assume that everybody else knows what they know. And so they become right. underconfident relative. So, you know, when we're talking about confidence, it really is just about your perception of your own skill. And so it's very easy to overestimate it and very easy to underestimate it. And that is going to affect how you feel about your skill set. But that's not an accurate reflection of your actual skill set. So, I mean, ideally, we want to have those two things aligned, right? You want your perception of your skill to be equal to your skill, but that's an impossibility, right? There's always some, uh, you know, kind of gray areas here. However, we want to identify the flaws like perfectionism, like this Dunning Kruger effect that kind of pull you farther away from that reality. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the, in, in poker, we call them fish, right? It's the people that, you know, you sit down at a poker table. Right. And if you don't know who the weakest player is, then it's you. The problem is, <laughs> you know, when you're sitting down into the markets, you don't get to see all the other people at the table. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's harder for, you know, weaker traders to really get that mirror in their face that says, dude, you're the one that sucks here. Right. I, I think a lot of traders don't understand that, that they are, they are actually dealing with people. A lot of people don't, they, they don't want to trade because they don't want to deal with people. And it's like, well, you don't understand. You're dealing with more people than you've ever dealt with in your life. And yeah. the competition is more fierce than it's ever been. Exactly. Even if it's an algorithm, it's still an algorithm created by a person. By a person. Exactly. And, um, oh gosh, where was I going to go? I had, I had, oh yeah. A, a common problem that, that I see with a lot of traders is they key their confidence level into their recent profits and losses. So we see these traders, right? They, they, they come in and they start dabbling with small amounts of money. If they happen to have, if they, well, put it this way, right? This is the no-win scenario where trader goes nowhere. If he happens to lose, he jumps systems or does something. If he happens to win, which we both know is luck-driven, if he happens to win, 
then he builds his confidence level on that. And then he increases size. Sometimes he quits his job and goes out trading full time or whatever, right? And their confidence level is super high. And then, of course, they're oversized at some point. They experience that normal loss. And then their confidence level hits the floor. Yeah. So how do we pro- avoid that? I mean, I think we, we got to look first at motivation and, and, and goals here. I mean, yeah. are you, do you want to become a trader or do you want to make money? You know, and, and there's a subtle difference between those two. You can obviously do both, but if you want to make money, then, then go to the casino. I mean, it's, it's certainly cheaper. They'll, they'll, they'll eventually, you know, make you leave. But I mean, you know, in reality, like the, the desire to become a trader implies a desire to develop competence because mm-hmm. there's nobody in their right mind that would look at seasoned traders and say, oh, I want to be like you and then make 50K in a day and say, oh, I am like you. I mean, that, that's, that, that's not how it works. And anybody who has developed competence in anything else understands that. So how do you like, kind of break through the people who are just out there looking to make a quick buck? I, I don't have good answers like that. I mean, I think, you yeah. know, by and large, you know, at least in, a, in Western society. Let me ask you another question. You know, how, do you know, is- how do you know that you're the person who's just looking for quick money versus the person who's going to be a trader. Because I have a lot of people who I talk to where when I look at what they're doing, they're looking for easy money, but they swear they're trying to become a great trader. Yeah. I I, I haven't worked. So you, you've got more experience in that. Um, You know, know, the people that I work with and, you know, typically the people that, you know, buy my books are ones that kind of raise their hand and say, you know, yes, I want to actually work to, to get better, whether it's at my mental game, you know, or becoming a better poker player, trader, or, you know, you, you name it. So, yeah, I, I mean, breaking through delusion is tough. Uh, breaking through that yeah. layer of overconfidence is tough. You know, I, by and large, people in Western society tend to be overconfident. You know, you look at the research, 60 to 70 percent of people believe that they have above average intelligence you know, have above average, right. you know, s- a sense of humor. And, and, and I'm and probably one of them, right? <laughs> As are you, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just endemic in, in society, right? So, right? so by and large, you're going to think, okay, you know, A, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the one that's going to make easy money. I mean, I think if, if, if people knew um, what the road looked like, you know, yeah. they um, probably wouldn't take it. <laughs> they probably wouldn't take it, or at least they would at least be prepared for it. Yeah, it wasn't. And if, and if they wouldn't take it because their, their, their true motives were, you know, kind of not aligned with the reality, then that's not a bad thing, right? If, no. if you want to become a, a trader, you've got to be prepared, you know, to do the work. I've, had, I've got clients who've struggled for three years to become profitable, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and that doesn't mean that every trader has to go through those struggles, right? Some people do get lucky and find a good system for them. They get lucky yep. or they are already kind of, you know, have established, you know, firm understandings of, the nature of variance and the nature of the markets and what they need to do to be successful. So yeah, you can learn faster, but if you make money in the first three to six months, you know, the odds are very great that you're just getting lucky. And if at a minimum, you should just assume that that's true. You know, I and, think that's a good point. Yeah. 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 Assume that's true. Um, speaking of variance, come in. I want to, <laughs> cons- I want consistent results with my trading. I get that all the time. It, it, you, you, you'll have someone come in and, you know, what's the challenge? Well, my results aren't consistent. What do you think about getting consistent results in a field like trading? I mean, if you want consistency, buy a bond. Right. So, I mean, so cool. my, my, my first definition is my first, my first question is what is your definition of consistency? I mean, right? I, I think it, I think it's consistent execution. I mean, it's consistent right. process. It's, it's consistent desire to be leveling up and having, a routine that is both, you know, one that prepares you to perform at a high level. And that also helps you to, you know, extract what you've learned from the day and continues to have a process for researching and developing your strategy, uh, developing your system, developing your competence, right? That, that, that kind of consistency, but you know, that, that takes a lot of discipline. Um, a, a lot of traders are attracted to this, not just because of easy money, but also because of the freedom. It's a lot like poker players, right? We don't want right the nine to five job. We don't want that structure. Here's the difference though. You are the one that defines it, right? (laughs) Structure and discipline does not constrict freedom. It actually helps to accentuate it. Um, And and the way that I've I've related this a lot of times too, is, is the relationship between an artist and their tools. So if you are a painter, let's say, 
And, you know, there's a certain degree of creative expression that you're trying to present on a canvas, your ability to uh, convey what is in your mind and what you see is entirely dependent on your competency in using your fingers and using the tools of the paintbrushes that you have and the materials that you have. So as a trader, you have to understand that developing that competence, developing a, a disciplined routine is your tool for extraction, right? You're not going to go mining for diamonds with your hands. I mean, right. there's, there, you need to develop the machinery to extract an edge from the market. And that, you know, construction is not something you can develop just by showing up and doing whatever you want. Yes, you can get butt-ass lucky and find a diamond on the ground, right? Yes, you can be, you know, have the right tools and be able to create a painting exactly as you, as you want. But to develop it over, over a, a sustained period of time, you need to have a system that is going to produce that. And so I'm not saying, you know, OI all of your desires for freedom, I'm saying that that the discipline is what becomes the 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 uh, the, the metric, not the metric, the um, the mechanism by which you can attain that freedom. But ultimately, you're the one making all the decisions. So there's freedom in that, right? There's choice in that. That is not you know being told what to do, where to go, when to show up, right? You can still take mm -hmm. days off. You can still take months off, right? You can Absolutely. have that kind of freedom. Um, so I think a, a big part of the uh, the ability to extract what you want from the markets comes from having a good understanding of, of what it means to, to develop that kind of mechanism. Yeah, I think, I think that's the type of consistency that tr traders should be striving for. Uh, I agree 100%. And I think this fallacy that they have that they're going to just be profitable all the time, right? Being profitable consistently means being profitable all the time. That's what the word consistently means. Um, like every day in every trade. Yeah, every day, every trade, right? Exactly. So, if they have that outlook, if that's their goal, what do you, what would you say to them? I'd say you're delusional. Um, you're delusional. I'd say, right. yeah. I mean, just yeah. and and just admit that, right? There's no, there's no shame in it. Like, right. the, I think the, we all want consistent profits. I, I do. Yeah, right? no, of course. I, I, I don't think it's a bad aspiration, right? It's just a bad expectation, right? And and the difference between those two is, like, one is I'm going to do everything I can to attain it, and if I fail, I'm going to learn and understand and grow and learn, you know, it's, there's a, a very kind of, um, uh, chaotic yet pr productive process. Whereas if it's an expectation and it doesn't happen, then you're pissed off, you're sad, you're, you know, you get fearful, you get overconfident. I mean, all of these things can kind of come out of that chaos of expecting that to be true. And, and it's just, it's just delusional. It's, it's no different than believing in Santa Claus. What, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Should have spoiler alert. Yeah, no, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I think that's a, a real, challenge that traders have is they have to be prepared to expect variability in results. I mean, it's not like a job, right? You don't go to the job nine to five and get a paycheck for how many hours you worked. It's like being a commissioned salesperson on, on, in a seasonal, on a ski, a ski area or something like that, right? Totally. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but it's also, you are like an athlete. I mean, you think about, okay, so Tiger Woods was insane when he won 25% of his tournaments, but he still only won 25% of his tournaments, right? I mean, so that means 75% of the time Tiger was, you know, either first or second loser, you know, depending on, on <laughs> what, what your definition of, of second and third place. The point being, right. That, he was like the best in the world at 25%, right? At 25%. So. Yeah. Most, most, most golfers are winning at best, you know, two to 3%, right? I mean, how many, um, you know, basketball games do players typically win? You know, how many, uh, what, what's a, what's, you know, the, the, the average batting uh, for uh, baseball players? Uh, you know, NFL football. I mean, you just go down the sport, like the sports world is mostly riddled with failure. If we look at it from a who's winning championships, who's winning games and who is not, who's getting, you know, it, the sport. So as a trader, it's the same kind of mechanism, right? The consistency is, are you able to consistently extract an edge and, and have that edge be demonstrated? Right. And whether that gets paid off or not is not your in your control in the short term. And, and, you know, it, much as it is with, with professional sports, I mean, you have a lot of control, but you can't control, you know, your opponent's ability to just have like an amazing game, right? You might've had, I mean, yeah. so the, the British open in 2000, I'm going to get this wrong. I'm going to say it was like 13, 14, 15, um, Phil Mickelson and Heinrich Stenson went toe to toe in one of the best Sunday head to head uh, battles in a, in a major championship. 
these guys beat third place, I think by six or seven shots. Okay. Usually wow. one player like kind of jumps out in the field and, and runs away with it. I think Heinrich Sension shot, shot 64 that day and Phil Mickelson shot, shot 65. Right. So here's, here's Mickelson playing amazing golf to win pretty much every other British, British Open championship in the last 20 to 20 to 30 years. And he gets beat by a guy who just happened to play better. So yeah. that stuff happens all the time. You cannot control your opponents. You cannot control the market. You can only control your own execution. And look, I mean, I'm sure Phil wasn't happy about it, but to play that well under those conditions, I'm certain he was happy about. That is unbelievable when you when you look at that. And you, I, I love the way you put that when you take a look at sports. And maybe you know, in the future, talking with clients, maybe I could actually bring that up and say, hey, who's your favorite sports football player or whatever? And, and, <laughs> How much have they failed? Yeah, right. How much have they failed? And that, yeah, that's a very common thing with trading too. And you know, what do we tell these people who say, I'm afraid of failure? And then, I mean, we can, we can start to extract the, the whys around that, right? So yeah. let's say it's, it comes from their previous, uh, you know, performance experience where, you know, they, they, you know, let's say played baseball growing up or they, you know, maybe we're an actor. I'm not going to just kind of keep this exclusive to sports, but you know, you were, you were the one that failed and it hurt. It kind of scarred you. Sometimes that scar tissue lingers. And so you're now fearful of failing because you don't want to repeat patterns of the past. You know, I mean, there's there's a litany of advice out there that talks about how, you know, failure can be used as the foundation for growth. Right. Um, you know, Edison didn't find a thousand ways. Uh, you know, Edison said he, he found a thousand ways not to make a light bulb. Right. So, you know, there's ways of kind of flipping it. But if that doesn't if that kind of reframing doesn't work, uh, it typically means that, that there's a there's an impact of failure that is probably going to be personal. Uh, and, and, and make you feel like you're a failure or that you have certain expectations of yourself that if they go unfulfilled, then you are going to, you know, kind of have this sort of halo of negativity that's going to kind of carry with you for years. And so, you know, kind of standing on the precipice of something that's going to put failure at risk, it, it becomes incredibly threatening and, and people kind of back off from that. So we really do need to kind of isolate the why failure feels so impactful. And once you are able to isolate that, you can begin to kind of work through it so that, you know, jumping off that cliff, you know, feels, you know, not like you're jumping off, you know, a uh, hundred feet, but more like, you know, a diving board in your backyard. Yeah. You know what, when we talk about failure and I deal with this a lot with people, a lot of the times the bigger challenges that the failure or the consequences of the failure are actually undefined. In other words, they don't, create a clear definition for what that means if they lose a trade. And when you don't do that, the unconscious mind goes nuts. It's a, it, it, and we do this thing called a thought download where we just basically, we write stuff down we say, so what? So mm -hmm. what? So what? And it always leads to basically, I'm going to die. And if your brain at the unconscious level is thinking you're going to die if this doesn't work out, you're going to be scared, right? <laughs> you would think so. <laughs> so part of that is just clearly defining what does, you know, at least at a logical level, what does this loss actually mean? Mm -hmm. You know, what are the actual consequences of this? You have, you know, a thousand dollars less in your bank account. Who cares? You know, you could spend that taking your family out to an amusement park nowadays, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so once they realize that it's not that big a deal, of course, they have other attachments to it. If I if I don't make money this time, it means I'm never going to make it as a trader. I'm, mm -hmm. uh, my wife's going to not love me, and she's going to leave me, and all my, you know what I mean. So, I think it's it really is helpful to bring that out. Yeah. And so, and so what I start to look at in that, in that process too, is, you know, what are some of the, the flaws that get associated with that? And one that you just mentioned there is, you know, kind of this projection of the future. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what's interesting is that a lot of times in that scenario, uh, people who are lacking confidence, or in this case, you know, fearing failure, they have this projection of the future. And the problem is not that you're making that projection, right? Because that's an effect, an essential kind of element to what we do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> The problem is that you're actually making a prediction that you think is factual reality. And in this case, you're actually overconfident, right? So you believe that what you think is going to happen is what's going to happen. And you're basically just a shitty psychic. I mean, you do not <laughs> make predictions, right? You're not a, a freaking soothsayer here. So, you know, it, I think sometimes that recognition helps to kind of crack through the veneer of, of what, what's going on. And you start to realize, ah, okay, 
what I'm projecting is not factual reality. And so when the, what is, what is going to happen? Actually, I have no freaking clue. It, right. You know, it's more open and, and the flip side can be true too. And this is part of what feeds the overconfidence is that, you know, you're expecting to make money, you're expecting the next trade to hit. And so understanding that, you know, those are actually estimates or predictions. They're not, you know, kind of factual realities it's not factual. can help to start to kind of buffer that, you know, that, that euphoria as well. And I think when you think it is, I think when you, or I believe when you actually believe it's factual and then it doesn't come to pass, yeah. that's going to trigger fear, right? Because okay. now you don't feel, now you're incompetent or, or whatever, your predictions are bad. Yeah. And that's, that's how you kind of get undercut with, with the overconfidence. Um, yeah. I mean, I kind of imagine overconfidence is like the, that cartoon character that like runs off the cliff and doesn't know it yet. Uh, right. You know, it's like <laughs> once they realize it, then, then they have their oh shit moment. And that's, that is, yeah, that it's like, you know, you get the carpet yanked out from underneath you and, you know, especially what I see a lot of times with, with traders who kind of cycle through that overconfidence and underconfidence is those cycles often are t- oftentimes are caused by the same flaw, right? So this mm-hmm. flaw of predicting the future, the, this illusion of control, um, an illusion of learning, um, you know, they, you know, when, when things are going really well, you think you've learned instantaneously, you think you're in full control, you think, you know, your predictions are all coming true. And then on the flip side, and so the, all of that feeds the, you know, that, that overconfidence. And then on the flip side, you know, you think all your predictions are, are, are garbage. You, you, you think you haven't learned a thing. You think you're in control of nothing. And so that all feeds the negativity. But but really, we're talking about the same flaw that needs to be corrected in sort of two places. And so over time, if you kind of attack those flaws and correct them, you can start to kind of modulate the the severity of both sides of the emotion. So, you know, it's it's kind of like a, you know, a, a, a position that's kind of ranging, you know, kind of upward. We're, we're not trying to... Cr- create these big spikes of volatility anymore. Right. And you kind of right. can, can squeeze the, the emotional variance in a sense, uh, you know, a lot narrower. He'll have a more consistent emotion, so to speak. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. More balance there. Excellent. Excellent. Well, is there anything else you want to share with anybody? No, I appreciate the time. I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll make a quick plug for the book. It's just, uh, you know, the mental game of trading is uh, available everywhere except on audio book yet. Um, you know, that'll be out soon, but kind of wherever you buy books in whatever form, um, you know, you can go get it. And, uh, you know, more information on me is at, at jaredtendler.com or on Twitter at, at Jared Tendler. Excellent. We'll put those links in. Thank you for sharing and spending the time with us. We really appreciate your, your wealth of knowledge. And, and by the way, I do have the book. It's an excellent book and we highly recommend it. So thanks, John. I appreciate that very much. Thank I you. appreciate the time. And that is what I have for you today. I hope you consider purchasing Jared's book. It's an excellent book on trading performance, and I highly recommend it. Also, if you have any questions or comments or anything else you'd like to see on the next Trading Performance Podcast, please write that in the comments, and I'll answer any questions for you personally. Thank you for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you on the next Trading Performance Podcast.